I'm Roby Brock. Welcome to this edition of Talk Business and Politics. On this week's agenda, the U.S. economy grew at 2.6% in the third quarter. Does this mean a recession is averted or is the danger still lurking? Economist Mervyn Jebaraj offers his assessment. In the race for Arkansas governor, libertarian Ricky Dell Harrington has a mission. What is it and will he succeed? These interviews plus the biggest headlines of the last week are all coming your way. Stick around for the next half hour. We'll talk business, politics, and much more. Welcome to the program. I'm Roby Brock. Thank you for joining us. Thursday morning, the Commerce Department reported that the U.S. economy rebounded in the third quarter with a 2.6% rate of growth. This comes after two quarters of declines, which had spooked investors, analysts, and economists into predictions of a possible recession. Could that still happen? I caught up with Mervyn Jebaraj, economist with the University of Arkansas Walton College of Business, to discuss. Now, Mervyn Jebaraj, economist with the University of Arkansas Walton College of Business. Mervyn, as always, good to have you with us. Thank you for being here. Pleasure. All right. We get on Thursday morning, we wake up to a GDP figure from the Department of Commerce that says that the third quarter uh, economic output for the U.S. was 2.6% in terms of growth. Definitely different from what we've seen in the previous two quarters where we've had negative GDP growth. Uh, does this mean we are officially out of a recession? Does this mean we will avoid a recession? What's your interpretation? Well, certainly if you had bet that there was a recession going on in the United States, you've lost that bet at this point. Uh, but I think the truth of the matter is that we were not in a recession, um, at least up till the third quarter of uh, 2022. So even though the first two quarters uh, showed a negative reading on GDP. They were due to very specific factors related to international trade, which dragged the overall uh, GDP figure negative. Uh, this quarter, the higher positive rate was also because of international trade. It just went the opposite direction. So net exports were higher uh, in the third quarter data that we got for net exports were lower in the first and second quarters. So uh, within the domestic economy, it's essentially been growing at a very low rate. Um, so while it's not a recession, it's not booming like the economy was last year either. So uh, we have sort of a low growth rate in the U.S. economy as far as domestic consumers are concerned. Um, consumer spending is still positive, but is much lower rates than it was last year. And between the second quarter and the third quarter, consumer spending, the overall rate of increase in consumer spending declined, um, which depending on how you look at it, the Federal Reserve, for example, might look at that as evidence of saying um, that their rate increase is working and that consumers are pulling back and that maybe that will have an effect on inflation going forward. So um, to the question of, you know, was there a recession in 2022 so far? The answer is no. Unlikely that we will enter a recession in 2022. But I think there's still, given that the domestic economy is growing at such a slow rate, uh, there's still a very high likelihood that we will have a recession in 2023, especially given that the Federal Reserve is going to continue with its rate increases. They're very likely to raise rates by 0.75% at their upcoming meeting um, this week. Um, it's likely that they will raise by at least 0.5 or more at the following meetings as well. And so given how much rate increases we've seen so far, both from the Federal Reserve here in the United States and the feedback loop that we're going to get from rate increases at central banks across the world, uh, I think it's very likely that in the first quarter and second quarter of 2023, we are going to see something that resembles a contraction. How deep it is, how long it is, is still uh, yet to be determined. And that is somewhat dependent on the path that the Federal Reserve may take at that point and how inflation looks. Let, let's talk about this. We, the, we can control what we can control domestically. So the feds can raise these interest rates. There are not a lot of other, to, these are blunt tools that they have to work with to deal with uh, what's happening in this recession or these recessionary pressures are worldwide. Um, obviously our economy is big and has a ripple effect around the world, but if we are to do some of these things, are we still dependent upon China to do something to spark their economy, Europe to do something to help with its recessionary pressures that it's saying, those are things outside of our control. And I'm just asking you as an economist, are we dependent on them being somewhat aggressive and working in lockstep with 
U.S. policy on this? Right. I mean, so I think as far as what the Federal Reserve can control, which is the rate increases that they have committed to at this point, um, I think there are a lot of people, myself included, that would argue that they should maybe slow down their rate hikes. We're not arguing that they necessarily stop their rate hikes. Inflation is still a concern in the U.S. economy. But maybe there are some signs that inflation might abate in the near future. So as far as the domestic economy is concerned, you know, the big drivers of inflation, at least the ones that people care about, are gas prices, rents, or you know, home prices, or how much people are paying in rent. And food prices, and some of those, you know, especially the rents nationally have gone down in the past couple of months. There's a lag between when that shows up in the official inflation rate. It usually takes five to six months to show up. So rents are going down today. They won't show up in the official inflation measures for a while longer. But we can argue that, you know, we may not need this level of rate increase if we see that coming in the future. The other piece is that food prices have also, you know, not declined significantly, but they're not increasing at the same pace that they were. Some food price measures have gone down some uh, from their highs this summer. And then gas prices are lower today than they were earlier this summer. They're a little bit higher this month than they were last month. Uh, and, you know, sort of the course of the war um, between Russia and Ukraine and whether or not the European Union uh, enforces a ban on Russian oil uh, later this year will sort of determine what happens with the oil gas prices. But as far as what the Federal Reserve can do, I think there is some evidence, and at least in my opinion and some others, that they could um, continue raising rates, but at a lower rate that maybe we don't need to raise by 0.75 each time they meet, that maybe a 0.5 or something is more appropriate given where we are uh, seeing an overall economic slowdown in terms of output anyway at this point. All right, last question for you. You had a quarterly conference this past week, uh, really looking at things at the Northwest Arkansas economy uh, level. You might have a little state stuff in there too. Give me just the brief overview of what you discussed with uh, at the conference this week. Yeah, the you know we do an annual state of the region report for Northwest Arkansas, and we compare Northwest Arkansas to some aspirational peer regions like Austin, Texas, or Madison, Wisconsin, the Raleigh Durham area. Uh, in North Carolina or Provo uh, in Utah, Des Moines and Iowa. Um, and, you know, I think these are regions that are a larger than us, uh, certainly a lot more advanced in their economic uh, development goals than we are in North North Arkansas, but it gives us something to look at and say, how do we measure against those types of regions? And um, I think we find that we generally compete fairly well on things like employment growth and population growth and unemployment rate and things like that. So those are measures where we do better than most of those peer regions, or at least in the top three of those peer regions. Um, some other measures, you know, things like the overall median income, for example, even though ours went up 16% over two years, which is the fastest pace of increase uh, compared to our peer regions, it's still you know, a lower median income than most of those peer regions. In part, that's because we have fewer people with a college education here in North Shore, Arkansas. So we're just over 33% of our population that has a college degree here uh, in North Shore, Arkansas. And so compared to some of those best peer regions who have, you know, 48 and 50% of their population above the age of 25 has a college degree or higher. Uh, obviously, they have then also, you know, 15 to 20 percent more um, median income than North North Arkansas. So those are, again, areas where we could improve uh, research expenditures from the university, also lower than some of those big universities in those regions. So, again, that's another area where we could stand to improve as well. So overall, there are obviously some places where North North Arkansas is very attractive, uh, but it also shows us some of those areas where we have work to do and certainly are uh, doing some work on as well. And you can read about um, that report at our website at talkbusiness.net. And I'm sure you can go to the University of Arkansas Walton College website and read some statistics on that as well. He's Mervin Jebaraj. He's an economist with the University of Arkansas Walton College of Business. Thank you so much. As I indicated, that's Mervyn Jebaraj, economist with the University of Arkansas's Walton College of Business. You can catch more of our conversation at talkbusiness.net. Now, after this break, there are three candidates in the race for Arkansas governor. You'll learn something new about one of them, Libertarian Ricky Dale Harrington, after this. 
Time to run through some of the biggest headlines of the last week as we go Inside the Numbers. Inside the Numbers is brought to you by the Arkansas State Chamber of Commerce and Associated Industries of Arkansas. Well, the University of Arkansas Business Hall of Fame announced four inductees into its 2023 class. They are Kurt Bradbury, Chief Operating Officer for Stevens, Inc., Fletcher Lord, Chairman of the Board for Bumper to Bumper Crow Burlingame Company, Judy McReynolds, Chairman, President and CEO of ArcBest, and timber banking and philanthropic giant Ross Whipple. $219.5 million, that's the strength of the strong revenue growth, larger purchasing trips, and improved same-source sales for Murphy USA. They reported third quarter profits that were more than double from a year ago. The El Dorado-based gas and convenience store operator reported third quarter revenue of nearly $6.2 billion and net income of $219.5 million. Simmons First National Corporation reported higher revenue and flat net income. The Pine Bluff-based financial institution, which is the parent of Simmons Bank, reported $80.6 million in third quarter profits. That is equal to its $80.6 million one year ago. And you can keep up with stories like these each and every day at talkbusiness.net. A quick break. We're back with Libertarian candidate for Arkansas Governor Ricky Dale. Well, there are three candidates for Arkansas governor. We had Democrat Chris Jones on the program two weeks ago. Republican Sarah Huckabee Sanders has declined our 28 invitations over the last 22 months to appear on this program. And her campaign says she, quote, respectfully declines to do so before election day. The invitation remains open, but we just wanted our audience to know we have made significant efforts to give her an unedited, open platform to present her policies. Today, we sit down with a third candidate in the governor's race, Libertarian Ricky Dale Harrington, who joined me on our sister program, Capital View. What do you make of the fact that Sarah Huckabee Sanders won't engage in some of these uh, interviews? She seems to stay in a safe space of Fox News and, uh, and very programmed personal events. Well, it's a control, obviously, uh, from a political standpoint. You know, you're going out there, you're talking to people, you want to be able to mitigate any sort of ramifications that might happen to you if you have one of those moments that are yeah. quite prevalent for politicians on stage and things like that. So I, I can see the political strategy from that point, but when it comes to wanting to be governor of Arkansas, we have to talk to the people. That's what our government is about. It's a participatorium of all of us. We don't have rulers. The people are the rulers. Yeah. All right, let's talk a little bit about your uh, policy on taxes. You have said that you want to end the grocery tax. The grocery tax has been reduced down to the final eighth of a cent on grocery taxes. That will have to be removed by, the const by constitutional amendment. Are you going to lead a constitutional amendment campaign to do that? You could do that whether you're governor or not. Yes, yes, sir, I could. Um, as I've said during that debate, I felt it was a, an immoral tax to begin with. And on principle, I don't care if it's an eighth of a cent, it should be totally gone. Yeah. How would you replace the revenue for Parks and Tourism and the Game and Fish Commission, which is what the majority of that eighth of a cent funds? Maybe we can turn it to... Uh, you know, a service, a fee for service or a fee for uh, being able to go to those places. You know, sometimes I might be speaking from my own mind and not trying to project on others, but there's a lot of benefits that we get from those parks. And if, if there was a slight price increase on that, why not? Why not pay for it? Wow. I love going to the diamond mine all the time anyway. <laughs> How many diamonds have you found? So, None. None. All right. Well, keep going. So. Um, yeah, and also, too, I mean, I guess you would have to advocate for higher, um, you know, license fees for, for hunting and fishing and stuff like that to replace that lost revenue, too. Is that what I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but did, would that be an option? Well, I, I really wouldn't want to do it, but I want to be pragmatic about things. The hunting license that we have here in Arkansas is probably one of the cheapest I've ever. I'm a Texas native, yeah. and them hunting licenses over there are extremely expensive. And whenever I came to Arkansas and I saw uh, $10 for a hunting license, I knew I wanted to stay here and live. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, too. You also have talked about phasing out the state sales tax. Again, I would think that you have the same logic about, um, you know, consumers and that it's difficult on people, uh, particularly lower income people, to have to pay that extra sales tax. But that sales tax constitutes a huge percentage of state government funding. Um, where do you make up the difference for that? Because it... it 
I know on the latest general revenue report, it was almost 50% mm -hmm. of, um, of state general revenues. That's a lot of money. You're going to cut state government in a big way, or are you going to replace that revenue by raising some other tax? I would like to cut uh, spending and cut some of the um, executive branch. Mm -hmm. um, you got some specifics on that? I mean, or is this just in theory? Honestly, I'm telling you the truth, this theory. Okay. Because the truth of the matter is you don't really get to see that whole picture until you're right there at the mountaintop. Um, anybody that's ever been governor has never been governor unless they've been governor. Yeah. Um, there's just the truth of it there. Well, I'd push back on you a little bit on that. The, the state budget is a public document. They debate it almost year-round up at the state legislature. You can look at the state budget and determine here's what we spend on education, here's what we spend on higher education, here's what we spend on prisons and public safety, here's what we spend on health and human services. That's about 95% of the budget right there. You could look at some of that right now and give me a couple line items that you think that you could cut. I don't have it in front of me, but, mm. um, but you could do that. You don't have to wait until your governor to do well, that. Well, first off the, off the top of my head, I'm thinking about the boards and commissions, and there's about $40 million there uh, that's dedicated to boards and commissions. And, uh, you know, my thinking is, if you're on that type of board there, is it possible that you'd be volunteering for it? Or, you know, how are we spending that money for the boards and commissions? Is it really helping the people? Or is it maybe, you know, money going somewhere and we don't really know what, what is really actually being done about it? I think in, in theory it's regulating those different, you know, um, industries and, mm -hmm. and occupations that people have. I mean, do you want to get rid of the plumbers and licensing board? Do you want to get rid of the engineers board? I mean, do, don't you think those things need some regulation? Well, one of my campaign platforms has been occupational licensing reform and trying to reduce some of the extra burdens for people to be able to get into those fields there. We need standards. Obviously, we need standards to make sure that people are competent in what they do and also making sure that the people are safe. That's what the boards are for, if I am understanding it correctly. And that they oversee um, you know, those professions, we, that they are on a professional level. You know, sometimes people don't have the money to go to college, but they may have the ability to acquire the knowledge and then demonstrate that they're competent in it. So we want to try to see if we can rearrange some of those occupational licensing laws or the administrations of occupational licensing to where right now the economy is really hurting. People might have money to go back to school, but they might have the ability to go into a new profession. Yeah. Um, let's talk about, that's another, I think, an interesting thought that you've thrown out in terms of your platform. You've talked about reinstituting something called the, the State Guard, mm. where people would trade basically public service for two years of community college, I'm presuming for free. I mean, tell me a little bit about that. that yes, sir. Pro, that plan. That idea comes from what's going on right now in the, the global sphere. Uh, with the war going on in Ukraine, who knows if it might expand into something more and uh, the Arkansas National Guard can be federalized. And we still have to deal with natural disasters, we still have to deal with other type of events here in Arkansas. But what are we going to do whenever that big force right there is gone, maybe to uh, fight in a global com conflict, which I hope does not happen. But that's my main reasoning for that, uh, to reinstate the Guard, is to have a, an extra service force to be able to take up the slack in case Arkansas is hurting. Um, providing those two years of, of education at a state school, you know, we could be having more nurses, more plumbers, and more people that are working in trade jobs helping Arkansans. There'll be a price tag on that. I'm, I'm going to assume you hadn't put a price tag to that yet. So, in terms of how much that would cost to, say, develop 2,000 or 3,000 people to basically get free community college in exchange for some sort of state guard work right there. Yes, sir. You got a number on that? Um, no number. <laughs> Being honest with okay. you, no number. I've, I've taken enough. a look at the Texas State Guard and tried to research how they, because Texas, 22 states out of the Union have state guards. And I understand 
how some people may be fearful of a governor talking about reinstating the guard. Only the legislature has the power to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but I would like to put a plan for uh, reinstating it uh, for the security of a state. All right, he's Ricky Dale Harrington. He is your libertarian candidate for Arkansas governor. Always good to visit with you. Always find our conversations refreshing. And remember, if this run for governor thing doesn't work out, I think you could farm yourself out for some funerals and maybe even just some uplifting motivational speeches as well. So you got the pipes, you know, as they say. So. <laughs> well, I'm always trying to be of service. All right. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Best of luck to you. Thank you, sir. That's Ricky Dale Harrington, Jr. He's the Libertarian candidate for Arkansas governor. We're back to wrap up right after this. And before we go, I want to encourage you to stay up to date with us on the news that we provide. Follow me on Twitter at Roby Brock or at TB Arkansas. You can also sign up to receive our Monday through Friday email newsletter. It's free. You can find the sign up form on our website at talkbusiness.net. That's all for this edition of Talk Business and Politics. I'm Roby Brock. We'll see you next time.